Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Rome. First, one brief but very important thank you to our newest patrons on Patreon, Alexander Mulberg and Sean Greening. Thank you so much for your support. We really, really appreciate it. And if anyone else would like to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash theendlessknot. Now today, we're very happy to bring you an interview with award-winning podcaster and now New York Times best-selling author, Mike Duncan. Mike started his podcast, The History of Rome, 10 years ago, has since moved on to his Revolutions podcast, and joined us to talk about his new book, The Storm Before the Storm, The Beginning of the End of the Roman Republic, which is now out and available in both hardcover and audiobook formats. Welcome, Mike. We're so pleased to have you here with us to talk about, well, most importantly, your book, (laughs) and then some other stuff. (laughs) Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, we want to talk about the book, uh, but let's, <laughs> we can talk about other things too, for sure. But I thought we might as well start with, tell us about your book and when it's out and what it's about and why everybody should, if they have not already, as they were uh, supposed to, pre-ordered it, why they should do so now. <laughs> so the book the book is called uh, The Storm Before the Storm, The Beginning of the End of the Roman Republic. It comes out on October the 24th, 2017, um, which as we record this is just about a week from now, uh, but whenever you happen to be listening to it out there in the world, people, um, maybe it's already out, maybe it's about to be out. Um, And it is a book that explores, obviously, it's right there in the subtitle, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, because we all know the story of the end of the Republic. We all know about Julius Caesar. We all know about Antony and Cleopatra and Pompey. Um, And that sort of that last generation uh, that destroyed the Republic, their story is told and told and told over and over again. Um, But for for whatever reason, uh, the story of how the Republic started to collapse in the first place is very has been very, I think, undercovered, um, especially in in popular literature. So this book is hopefully going to um, going to shed light on what is a very critical period in the late Republic and in Roman history. And uh, you should buy it because, um, you know, I have got kids to feed. (laughs) I've I've got a mortgage now. (laughs) So those are those are the real brass tax reasons why you should buy the book. But um, I think, uh, you know, it's it's a great narrative history of, uh, you know, about 50 or 60 years of Roman history. I agree with you absolutely that it's a fascinating period. Mm -hmm. And one, as you say, that just isn't talked about as much because it doesn't have Julius Caesar and it doesn't have emperors. I mean, I think that's a simplistic reason, but I think that's a lot of it. Yeah, and it's and it's weird, that, at least to me. Like, I'm not complaining about it because it had always been like this golden opportunity, like this really uh, like like these this uncovered, um, like really rich and fertile territory that like nobody had homesteaded yet or whatever. And it's just like, oh, that's going to be great if I ever have the chance to, because like the Gracchi and Marius and Sulla and these guys, like they're they're just as like giant and interesting and um, and the times that they lived in were just as exciting as anything that Caesar was up to. I mean, mm-hmm. Sulla, I mean, you can't really say like, oh, the life of Caesar was really interesting and exciting. The life of Sulla was, oh, geez, what a boring drag. Like, no, that's <laughs> not, that's not at all the case. So yeah. I always, I always knew that those guys were going to be sitting there and I'd always, you know, kind of, I had this idea in my back pocket for a while and I'm really glad nobody else, um, made the really obvious decision to write about this period. This is good. You kind of um, preempted my, my question that I wanted to ask is, you know, why this period? But I I wonder, were you considering other periods? Were you sort of weighing a few options or was this just the one that you wanted to do? For, for the time, like when, when I was first approached about, uh, you know, whether or not I would like to write a book, the answer is yes. Um, and what, like what period I would like to cover. I think I had really settled on this period as this would have, this was like my, my a pitch, right? This was like my first pitch, but in general, like in, in sort of the broad scope of Roman history, um, like at some point I, I have always wanted to do something on the Samnite Wars, like that period mm-hmm. in Roman history, which is, you know, when Rome moves from being just like a local city state to masters of Italy. That that is also one of those 
periods that is so it's so important to the development of like all of roman civilization but again like nobody ever talks about the samnite wars um even if you go back to like the middle republic era it's you know it's all the focus is going to be on i mean not you know, unjustifiably on the punic wars and on hannibal yeah. um but you go back one you know a hundred years earlier in the samnite wars or really important and then also at some point uh if this book is a hit this is the other reason you need to buy the book is <laughs> if i if this book is a success then they'll let me write more books in the future and i would definitely like to tackle uh the crisis of the third century and everything that yeah. happened in that maelstrom uh in the in the 200s yeah the samnite wars um the big issue there i guess is sources there's so much more complicated or there's a lot of missing stuff for that period. In right. Ex way yeah. that's different, you know, that's different than what you, what you're covering in this book. You've got some decent, not perfect sources, but some decent sources for the uh, Gracchi to Sulla period. The Semnite Wars are a bit more sketchy. Yeah. We don't have any like Plutarch biographies of, yeah. of Corvus. I don't think. Um, <laughs> no, like no, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. But that that can mean it can be rich in other ways because you get to talk more about that. Um, that's one of the things that I wondered about for the book is um, who were the main sources you were using and how did you sort of decide how you would treat their credibility or their utility? Because there's a lot of things going on with um, people writing about that period. Yeah. So there's really there's four main sources um, for this particular period. And it is, um, it's Plutarch, it's mm -hmm. Appian, Sallust, and Cicero. And then yeah. Cicero's like, you know, Cicero does a lot of, like Cicero, unlike the other three, no, didn't write like a straight history of any of this stuff. But, um, he had so much commentary on all, most of these characters and most of the, the events of the period that he's yeah. filling in all kinds of critical gaps. So, yeah, it's really difficult to try to balance um, like what is true with what is more like in Plutarch's case. It's like, when is he actually telling you the truth and when or when is he just um, trying to make a moral yeah. point? Um, that's that's always the that's always the problem with with Sa uh, with Plutarch. And then with Sallust, it's like, is he telling the truth or is he just grinding mm -hmm. an axe? Um, because Sallust had like a bunch of axes to grind and, and he was grinding the hell out of them. <laughs> Um, yeah. but, but, it, and then, uh, and then Appian, now you're getting into, he's writing, you know, in the 200s AD, yeah. now you're, now you're getting to being centuries removed from the fact. And, and, you know, Appian provided, I think what I would consider to be the most reliable account of things just in the, like, which, which author would I go to, to say, you know, I generally speaking, he's getting me from point A to point B in a reliable way. I think Appian mm -hmm. was kind of a touchstone throughout the writing of the whole book. Right. And then you counterbalance that with the fact that Sallust, um, even though he had axes to grind, was just, you know, he's just a generation later. Yeah. Um, and Cicero is the same way, where Cicero has his own axes to grind, but he's just a generation later. And Cicero in particular was also like really kind of obsessed with if he was going to be working at all in historical settings like you know his dialogues are set um, yes you know like the, the the i forget which one it is now off the top of my head but there's one that's set like on the on the eve of scipio Aemilianus's death um and then on the orators is set with um just right there on the on the edge of the social war and he was yeah. really he was really concerned about getting the details right mm -hmm. so you rely you rely and then and then you just kind of mash them all together and be like <laughs> okay this is basically the story um and if you come across uh, contradictory things, do you try to explore them a little bit um, mm -hmm. or you just make a judgment call about which one was written better? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, there's, some, there's sometimes. Sounds you, nicer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, well, it's like, well, that's a really juicy quote from Solace yeah. right there. So like, let's let's go with Solace. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I liked about your podcasts. Um, well, I've, I've always, I mean, I like lots of things about your podcasts, but in particular, when I first started listening to History of Rome, um, which I'm going to tell you right up front, I did because I teach Roman history and I sort of found it. And I think, Mark, you, you found it first. It. Yeah. And you yeah. recommended it to me. And I started listening, not because I particularly like narrative history. I'm, I'm, I'm going to confess, I'm not actually 
usually much of a fan of narrative history. It kind of isn't my thing. And I started listening to it thinking, okay, let's just check how good this is. Because if it's good, I can make my students listen to it. And then I don't have to do this in class. And I can focus on the thematic (laughs) stuff that I like. And then I got hooked. So I started listening to it. And it would, even though I theoretically am fully trained in the period, um, it was very useful for reminding me of stuff. And also the high empire, I really never uh, spent much time on. So that was really, really helpful for me. But what I was going to say is that as soon as I started hearing, especially in your early episodes, the way you treated the problem of sources, you know, when you talked about Livy, using Livy for the early period of the kings and what the issues were, you didn't make a huge deal of it. You didn't footnote every sentence you you referenced um, a, a primary source in. But that was always up front that, you know, you were making decisions about what kinds of sources you were using and telling the stories, even though sometimes you knew that they weren't likely to be true, but they were good stories or they showed us something about the mindset of the time or whatever. And I always found that really, really good because that's something that I stress so much with students is how to read and think about primary sources in a critical way. And so I really appreciate that about that podcast. And and you've done the same in the revolutions. Um, And so I'm interested to see this in the book as well, because you have to balance that. Like, how do you tell a narrative in a way that's interesting and engaging um, without spending every five seconds saying, no, oh, but of course that might not have happened. <laughs> or, well, you know, that, that might have just been because he hated him or something. Yeah. Yeah. And in, and in the history of Rome, like the number of times that I was like, oh, there's two versions of what happened next, or like, yeah. or there's three versions of yeah. what happened next. It'd be, you know, I had so much room to sprawl out on um, mm-hmm. that I could really be like, okay, well, here's, here's one version of how it happened. Here's another version of how it happened. Yeah. Here's another version of how it happened. I will say though, just to, just to warn you, because this had to be a little bit of a, like a tighter ship, um, that I do make some choices about which version I'm going to follow without there. There's not going to be quite don't as signal much, everyone. Like, yeah. 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 You know, the, you know, the editors are like, come on now, we're trying to write a book for the people here. You can't. Oh, just, no, I exactly. You can't, you can't, you can't just sprawl for a thousand pages of, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, that even though the, 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 like the original versions of it, it's like, I'm going down all those little rabbit holes. But that, that does, uh, bring up the question that I had, um, you know, I'm interested about the process here. How did you kind of rework material from uh, a sort of spoken genre to a written genre? I mean, obviously, there's a certain amount of expansion. You cover this period in about, I think, seven or eight episodes. Um, so obviously, there's expansion involved there. But also, I'm thinking um, in change of genre. How do you... Um, engage a reader in a way that you, you know, in a different way than you would engage a listening audience? The first thing is that I started with a blank piece of paper um, for the book, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I never, I never was repurposing material from the history of Rome. I didn't start from the episodes that I had already written. Um, Like, I, I wrote it from scratch. And to the point of like, I, I mean, and you just had to do this, right? You would do this anyway, but I reread everything again. Like I reread all of Appian, I reread all of Plutarch, I was working. Mm. So I was, I was creating the book without any reference at all to, um, to what was in the history of Rome. And I mean, to the point there, there's definitely going to be like one or two things in the book. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to getting these emails from people that are <laughs> like, well, in you know, in the history of Rome, you said this. And then in the book, you said this, like, which is true. You guys, what's true is what I wrote in the book. <laughs> you know, there's, um, there's definitely, there's definitely a few things where if I could go back to the history of Rome, you know, I would want to change them a little bit. It's like, Oh wow. I kind of, whoops. Um, mm-hmm. but, but so I, so I was writing it from scratch completely because, um, I, I wanted to make sure that I was covering it in a new, with new and fresh eyes, right? I didn't right. want to be at all bound by what I had written before. Um, the other, the, the a challenge just for writing a book in general is, is to like, how do you keep people reading from one sentence to the next? How do you, how do you keep people turning the pages? And with the podcast, you know, that's very easy. You just, I just keep talking. Um, that's, that's how you keep, that's how you keep the listener engaged. Like that's how you keep the story moving forward is I just get to keep talking. So I've, I've been writing, you know, podcasts for 10 years. I've written like a million and a half words. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's like the combined total transcripts of, of everything from the history of Roman revolutions. And 
I always know whatever I'm writing, I can emphasize in a certain way, or I can, if it's a, if the sentence is a little convoluted, I can just kind of keep powering through it. Um, and so there's like, there's a couple of more layers of editing that I didn't, that I don't have to really worry about when it comes to the podcast that when it comes to the book, you know, you really, like, I just kept squeezing the pros and squeezing the pros and squeezing the pros to make sure that the, the sentences were reading clearly and just would keep, would keep going. Right. Because I'm not going to be there in your ear. I'm not going to be able to follow you around and like read the book to you. Um, there's obviously going to be an audiobook version of it, but like mostly people are just going to be sitting in a chair and reading it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, the sentences need to do the work for me. Yeah. So you found that in a, a different process or just sort of a, a, an adjustment of what you'd already been doing, as you say, every, where you did more revisions? Yeah. It was an adjustment of, of what I was already doing. There, there was some, there's much, much more. Um, on the revision side than mm-hmm. there usually is for a podcast. Cause you know, I gotta, I, I gotta knock out an episode every week. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, when it comes to the transcripts, you know, I'll write, I'll write a rough draft, then I'll edit it, then I'll edit it again. And now it's, Done. you know, Saturday, <laughs> Sunday. Now I, now I have to record yeah, <laughs> because right. I'm, you know, I'm, that's, that's the time for it. Um, so this, I had a lot more time to really, to really go back over it mm-hmm. like over and over again, which is, you know, good, good and bad because I mean, writers, I could revise anything again and again, definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely. Yeah. Like if, if I was given an unlimited amount of time, I'd still be on like episode one of the history of Rome because I would not, <laughs> I wouldn't be done with it. So it's actually a nice thing that I have to knock out episodes every week. It keeps me from um, getting too bogged down and, Oh, should that be that word or that word? Yeah. Yeah placing commas, which is one of the silliest things to do for a spoken <laughs> script, but I still oh, obsess over no, it. Actually, no, th- this is, no, this is really funny. I, d- so I actually discovered that my editor discovered on my behalf that I don't <laughs> use commas for anything. Um, oh, really? I just, yeah, sure. I write and I just like, I'm writing the sentence for myself. Right. So I know, I know how it reads. And when I, when I submitted the, um, the first draft of the, of the book, like when, when I was finally done with everything and I was like, this is my contractual, you know, time that I am submitting the book to you, you know, my editor was reading it and she was like, you just don't use commas at all, do you? And I was like, oh, I'd never really, I never really thought about it. Um, and so we had a, we had a whole process of (laughs) putting the commas in, (laughs) make it, make it. Yeah. Cause it's like, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, like the the readers aren't going to know how this, you know, three line sentence is supposed to actually read. So (laughs) a comma here and there would actually be helpful. So that's, you know, one of those little things that I just, it never even, I never thought about it because I never, I never use them for myself. That's interesting. I work on the page so much that I'm obsessive about commas because I can't read a script properly if I don't have my my pauses in, if you see what I mean, like the, for me, that's performance, uh, performance markings. It's almost like a time signature or something. So yeah. yeah. And you, you would, you would think that I would have commas all over the place so that I would know when to yeah. pause or whenever, but I guess I, I apparently it was just, I just insert them like automatically yeah. in my head. It's, um, well, it was it's very was, Roman yeah, of you. Never conscious of. But. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you do just fine in a world before well, I punctuation. Do, well, I, do, I do use spaces. I do. Enjoy oh well, that's spaces that's kind of wimpy, but I guess we'll I'm accept not, that. I'm not, I'm not fully Roman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you can capitalize and put spaces between words, you don't fully understand your language. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, and my uh, students always uh, are completely blown away when you show them in the first intro to Latin class. Well, this is what it would look like if your editors weren't so nice to you and <laughs> printed the Latin the way it had been written in the first place. It's like, no, I can't do that. Yeah, I've never I've never quite I've never quite understood how they did it. Yeah. But that's just probably because you know, we've been stamped a certain way. Yeah. You get used to what you're used to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one thing we like to to kind of get into with all of our guests is we're interested in connections, connections between life and work and different areas of uh, of what you do. And uh, I was wondering if there are any fortuitous or unexpected connections that you sort of came across, uh, you know, as you progress through the podcasts and doing the books and uh, and um, moving into podcasting as a moving into career. podcasting in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> Well, c- certainly I, when I started podcasting, which was, you know, July of 2007. Right. Um, so I just, so I just, I just had my 10th anniversary mm-hmm. as a podcaster. Um, so I started it as a hobby. Uh, it was just a thing 
to do. Yeah. Uh, it was an interest. It was an interesting thing to do on the weekends. Uh, like I had all of this, I'd been reading all these ancient sources. I kind of wanted to, I had a, I always have like a creative drive to do something. And this was just going to be like the something else that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you'd told me like in July of 2007, guess what, dude, like you, this is your career. Like <laughs> you just, you actually just started your career. Um, I would have been like, what are you talking about? Like, no, this is something I'll do for a little while and then I'll just move on. Like, it's probably not even gonna be a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so to have it just slowly but surely turn into uh, doing it on the side while I worked full time and then, you know, there started being enough ad revenue from Audible uh, once that sort of kicked in that it became a part time job. And then later, you know, after the history of Rome and moving over to Revolutions, when I made that move, it was like, OK, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to see if I can make enough money just from the podcast to do it full time. Um and that worked somehow. <laughs> I, still, I, still, I still don't even know like how it worked. And as, I, as I've said, um, you know, around in my life, just to people that I know, it's like, you know, I work all the time, but I don't have a job. I don't feel like I have a job um, because I am just doing what I would normally do. I, I read stacks of books and I make notes and I learn about history and then I explain it to people. <laughs> and that's just what I would be doing normally. That's just what I did in bars. Like we would just be sitting around in the bar and I'd be, I'd be yelling at you about Cromwell or something. <laughs> um, but, but now I get to do it. Now I get to do it in a microphone yeah. and have it make a living. So, um, yeah, the whole thing has been very, it's, it's one of those things where when you look back on it, it looks like a very logical procession and like something that maybe I had planned out or there was some kind of roadmap mm -hmm. at work. But it really, it really, there was never a roadmap to any of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that's a little lesson for um, looking back on historical progress, isn't it? <laughs> it looks like it all goes in an obvious direction and sometimes... <laughs> Right. Well, you know, that's, I mean, that's actually like one of my one of the things I, I like to do with the shows is to always try to tell like whatever whatever's happening in whatever given episode to as much as possible, try to tell it from their perspective without knowing the future, without knowing yeah. mm -hmm. how it's going to turn out, because there's there's always at any given moment, there's always like seven or eight competing versions of what could possibly happen next. Mm -hmm. And only one of them ultimately is successful. But and then we tell that version of it because it was the one that was successful without give without giving all the little like, oh, it could have gone this way and it yeah. could have gone this way. And then these guys were trying to actually make it go this other way. So I always try to keep that in mind. And, I, you know, and that is true that that's been a, a life, a life experience of mine um, that I think that's that is a bit informed by how my own life. <laughs> Certainly, this is not what I, I I mean, it's like when I was when I was a kid, I was like, eventually, I'll write a book. But how I how I got from from being a kid who wanted to write a book to actually having a book like that process is wow not I perhaps what you expect yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah not 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 at all um, what did you uh, I know that when you started History of Rome you, were you in in grad school or I'm trying to remember now because you did talk about it a little bit when you were but it's I haven't re listened to the early episodes now well the, the what what it, um the one of the things that got me going on the history of Rome, like why I was like, I, mm -hmm. this is something I should, is um, I was going to go back and get a, a master's That's right. uh, in education. Right. Uh, and I, I basically was at the point, I was in my mid-20s and I was like, hey, you know what, I, sh I should go be like a like a history teacher, social studies teacher, like, like all, cause I mean, even like, like politics and government and, um, and all that stuff is really interesting to me. So I was, mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking I would go back and get a, a master's in education and right. be, you know, essentially a social studies teacher. And that the history of Rome would be something that would be, you know, like in a, in a way, like an extracurricular activity on the resume, right. like, okay, I graduate, I graduated from school a couple years ago. I've just been kind of kicking around. Um, so what, what's going to recommend me above other candidates? And, and maybe the fact that I have this, this podcast that I do about Roman history would be something uh, that would recommend me. And then that just that step just never wound up being taken. There were some right. things that happened uh, in my personal life that kind of derailed me from that path anyway. Um, and then the show just kept being a constant. Well, yeah. everything, while everything else around me was kind of changing, um, the show itself became a constant. And then the show became, which very quickly stopped being a means to an end and just became an end unto itself. I, I, I was listening to another interview you were doing, the one on A History on Fire, I think. Um, and you talked about how 
uh, when you started podcasting, there were other history podcasts around. And since yours was one of the first podcasts I started listening to, I think I listened to a couple others, but they were more entertainment uh, ones right at the beginning. I was trying to reconstruct my own podcast listening history, and I've now completely forgotten <laughs> what order I started finding things in. Um, but I don't remember specifically what was on the ground. What you know, what podcasts were you listening to before you started History of Rome? What made you even know that podcasts were a thing? And, when, and did any of them kind of shape the way you decided to do at least the early part of History of Rome? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I discovered all of this. Um, it, was, it was around 2006, 2007. Yeah. And um, the, the thing that actually got me over to podcasting was that my, my sister-in-law had told me that there was this new thing where like Stanford and MIT were starting to just release for free, like lectures right. from professors, like, like classroom lectures, um, which is probably the beginning of the mass online, uh, court, like whatever that. Oh, the massive on open online courses, the MOOCs. Yes. Yeah. Massive open online courses. Like the, like the very like nascent beginning of that, which is just like, we're going to record lectures and just put them up on the website for free. Right. So I was like, wow, that that's, seems like a great way to just, you know, keep learning things. Um, <laughs> and that and so I was I was obviously exploring whatever history and philosophy um, stuff I could find. And then that bumped me over to 12 Byzantine Rulers oh, right. Um, right. by Lars Brownworth. Right. So that that was out right at that time. And I was like, well, this is this is a whole show. And, the, and I, I think that was probably like the most influential mm -hmm. um, show in terms of like how the original history of Rome uh, started to play out. But the, th the, th the other, the other, the, I, I tell that story a lot and, you know, people know that how much I was influenced mm -hmm. by him and, and he, blur he Lars blurred the book for me, awesome. um, which was yeah. a, like a, per like an absolutely lovely, uh, lovely thing. Um, it means a lot to me. Uh, but the other side of it that I, I rarely tell this part is that there were a lot of other podcasts that were out there that I would click on and I would listen to them and they just weren't that good. Right. Um, they were they were very amateurish. Uh, you could tell that they were clunky and not very well done. And I, so I obviously won't name any of those <laughs> because that would be rude. Um, but it was really it was sitting there like listening to something that was kind of inspiring, like 12 Byzantine rulers. And then having other podcasts that were on iTunes that just weren't that good. And I was like, okay, I might not be as good as the best podcast, but I can certainly do a better job than whatever these guys are up to. Um, right. So that kind of gave me, that, it, it, it gave me like at least a boost of confidence that like, you know, there was space for you. having some, yeah. Yeah, there yeah, there was and like it, obviously obviously there's no quality control. <laughs> so, <laughs> Nobody's going to refuse you the option of doing this. Yeah, yeah. like like as long as yeah, as long as I'm not sitting there just like screaming obscenities into a microphone. <laughs> they're going to put it up. <laughs> probably they're just going to approve it and put it up. Yeah, cuz like and I think I can do a better job than these people and I and I think that wound up being um being true. Yeah. So in history of Rome, you were definitely doing a narrative history though as the you'd break a aside sometimes when it was appropriate to talk about larger thematic stuff. When you moved on to revolutions, each of the revolutions is a narrative history, but in a sense, you're doing overall thematic history. You're obviously doing revolutions. You're talking about revolutions. What do you sort of see as the benefits of doing a more narrative or more chronological approach versus a more thematic approach? And do you kind of try to balance those or do you have a, a an a preference when you're doing them. Well, in in my opinion, I think a narrative history is much more accessible, right, uh, to people, right. If if this is like your entry point into history, where you're learning about something new for the first time, I think it's, I think it's way more accessible to be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna start at this point. Here are the people who were involved. Here's the order of events that it happened right. in. You know, then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Um, and once you have that grounding of like the who, what, when, where, like the basic, the basic, like, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, the plot elements, mm -hmm. um, then all of, all of the thematic stuff or more, you know, specialized takes or zooming in on some particular aspect of it or pulling back and trying to draw some like bigger conclusions. I think all of that is much easier once you have the basic narrative structure in your head that you can you can like hang things on, right. and 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 most of what I do since I'm like, you know, I'm a I'm a 
popularizer of history or a, or a popular historian that, you know, a lot of most people are coming at this not knowing anything about the subject matter. Right. Um, so I, I think that definitely narrative history is, is a great way, um, great way to get people on board with the program of history being amazing and awesome and worth exploring all the time. Um, <laughs> so, I, so it's great propaganda for the for the for the discipline. Um, so I, I think that's a big part of it. And then also, um, I just I, like, like you say, like um, there are thematic things that you want to introduce or you do want to get if you do want to get into more analytical mm -hmm points i think it's easier to peel off from a narrative and take a look at where we are and where we're going rather than starting from here's a here's a nebulous concept like revolutions and i'll try to fit things into it it's more like here's all the things that happened and then what we can at the very end like i hope to have some sort of like grand theory of um of revolution or progression of revolutions yeah, I was going to ask about that because I do think you do seem to be kind of drawing, um, you know, obviously you can't go from one to the next to the next without starting to see parallels or uh, larger points. I mean, and you you mentioned those as you as some of them as they come up. Um, do you do you have that kind of a sense for Rome? I mean, having done that big sweep of immense amount of history and immense number of people, were there things that at the end, you feel like you sort of <sighs> conclusions, that's a strong word, but conclusions you can draw about Roman history, about history in general, that you didn't feel like you had that kind of understanding when you went in. Yeah, well, about, about the about the Romans in particular, um, I remember one, one of my big takeaways from the, there was like two that really developed along the way when it came particularly to mm -hmm. the Romans. And they, they're both kind of linked to each other. So as you as you walk through Roman history from the beginning to the end, um, the Romans were always really successful and uh, did really well when they were working on kind of a meritocratic system, right? When when the idea was that the like sort of the best man for the job would get the job, then the job would get done, and. Rome was always struggling and at its worst when they were like, oh, well, you're the son of a noble, son of a noble, son of a noble. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give you command of this army. And then that guy's an idiot and he doesn't know anything. Um, then things would start to go badly for them. Right. And their, so, their socio-political economic structures were always, were always um, at risk of falling apart when whatever elite happened to be in power – um, tried to block anybody else from sharing in the spoils or sharing in the wealth or sharing in the right. power. And they always, Rome always flourished whenever they were like, you know, oh yeah, of course you can come in. Um, you know, even if, even if it wasn't exactly like that well thought out, just the process of history, anytime, anytime Rome became sort of a meritocracy, it flourished. Anytime it became a closed minded elite, it, it started to struggle. Um, so that was a big part of it. And then the other, the sort of the corollary to that is how um, ethnically diverse Rome was, mm -hmm. and how well actually the the Roman the, the the Roman idea, right? Like Rome stopped being for just the Romans fairly early yeah. on, where the the ideas of of citizenship and law, uh, you know, infrastructure, how you how you plan a community, uh, how you run an army, like these these became ideas that were as uh, imbibable in Syria as they were in Spain, as they were in Britain, as they yeah. were in Algeria. Like it, it became, it became like almost like a universal plug-in, mm -hmm. right? You could take like the Roman mentality and really, really, so now it's like the Greco Roman mentality because you have like the Romans are, are doing the, the political infrastructure, military stuff in, uh, linked to like Greek philosophy and Greek culture and Greek ideas. Like once that, once those two things combined, that became instantly, it became, almost a universally adaptable mm -hmm. plug-in and it's the same sort of thing where the romans did well and flourished anytime that they just assimilated some new group that they encountered or some new group of migrants who came into the borders which happened like all yeah. the time um and started to struggle quite badly when they were like oh no you're somehow so different from us that we have to like destroy you or fight against you rather than uh, accept you and stamp you with our roman mentality um, and I, and I, that, that is a process that happened a number of times, especially during the empire. Yeah. Um, 
where I mean the the empire like like I said I, I have this great interest in um, the crisis of the third century I mean that was a bunch it was a bunch of guys from Croatia who saved the empire yeah. right it was not like oh the the Romans the, the old stock Romans from the Palatine Hill like <laughs> like you know salvaged their empire it was like no it, it was a bunch of it was a bunch of like Illyrian peasants um, who happened to have fully internalized the Roman idea and their place within the empire and identified not with, you know, they didn't see Rome as like an other. They they consider themselves to be as fully Roman as any um, actual ethnically Italian mm-hmm. Roman. Um, and as long as long as Rome was saying it was like letting those people <laughs> in and help them and like revive them and give them strength, uh, they did well. And then at the end, when they just um, I, th- I think that they got way too closed up and tight at the end when when those last runs of uh, you know Germans or, uh, and yeah. Goths and mm-hmm. Huns were coming over. They, I think they did a really poor job uh, interacting with and assimilating those groups. Yeah, I think I mean I certainly agree, and I think that it's even uh, it goes back not just to the empire, but Rome really was never anything but a group of people who came from diverse backgrounds and were assimilating into into a larger group. I mean, not just in its mythical sense, of course, with the the stories of Romulus and the asylum, but what you were talking about with the Samnite Wars in Italy, I mean, we think of Italy and Rome as being homogenous now, but it didn't feel that way to the Romans back when they were a city-state. They felt like there was a, and there, it wasn't homogenous. There were non-Indo-Europeans sitting just up north of them and all the rest of it. And they were already willing to uh, incorporate large groups of people in a way that very few of the surrounding uh, peoples were. And that was all, you know, from the very beginning. And I agree that it was failure to do so whenever they got too up on themselves as being, you know, one particular pure group uh, was a real flaw in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the whole, uh, yeah, the, the Roman idea is anybody can be Roman. Yeah. Right. Like by by yeah by the time by the time of the empire anybody can be Roman and you should want to be Roman and mm-hmm. and, and you know you, you learn Greek or you learn Latin so you can um, so you can communicate with each other but everybody did mm-hmm. um, and then it's just it's just fine yeah <laughs> it just it worked I mean there's a reason why it lasted for a thousand years or you, you know you tack the Byzantines onto it another thousand years I mean you don't you don't get an empire that lasts for arguably two thousand years without being able to incorporate new groups and new ideas. You just can't do it. Mm-hmm. They're all about being exclusive and hierarchical, but not about saying you can't be Roman. It's all about exactly. you know, free or unfree, what your rank is, all of those things. And they get more and more hierarchical. As, but it's not about saying you can't be Roman. And I do think that that's it, it, it's not really even a virtue so much. It's not that they were being particularly intentionally inclusive. They just saw it as a strength. Right. And it's it's hard to tell even like how much they actively thought this through mm-hmm. or if it was just something very subconscious about what about how just how their worldview. But yeah. I mean, take even like the slaves, like the Romans were very um, were very pretty open to like freedmen just being yeah. freedmen. Yeah. Right. Like you could be a slave later. You were freedmen. And then your now your status was changed. There was there was no yeah. like, oh, you there's a, there's a, there's no genetic or racial basis to slavery. It yeah. was a legal it was a legal state. And then the son of a freedman, you get you get two generations past and like, who even cares? Yep. That no, absolutely. You, had a, you have a slave in your past. Whereas we today, you know, we have a tendency to, uh, you know, once you are a certain thing, I th- um, the United States and I think the, the West in general has actually done a, a fairly decent job with this um, with, with, you know, birthright citizenship. You know, just you, if you're born here, guess what? You're an American. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually been a, quite a strength for the United States in a way that, you know, you go back to some of the old countries. I know Germany has this problem mm-hmm. um, so where they don't have. Yeah. Where they, they're like, if even if you were born here, uh, you're not a citizen. And even your children and your children's children, you could you could have a family living in, in some of those Central European countries for like a century. And they're still like outside mm-hmm. um, full citizenship, which seems to me probably because I'm an American who thinks things like that are crazy because if you're born here, you're a citizen. That's how it works for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's, a, those are dangerous things to be playing around with. <laughs> yeah, agreed. No. And, and the, um, I think it's, it's, uh, part of the tension and the interest of the Roman culture that being a slave or being free is this absolutely drastic, hugely important thing in your status. And yet is also permeable. And, you know, at the same time, and that those that uh, 
tension, I guess, is a, a really um, crucial mentality of the Romans and and gives them a lot of flexibility in a way that, I mean, the rest of the Mediterranean thought they were extremely weird for that permeability of status. Um, and yet, obviously, it worked pretty well. <laughs> well, one, one of them won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the rest of them were then conquered. Yeah. Yeah. So. Not, not to you know embed moral superiority in military strength, but <laughs> <laughs> you can't argue with the results. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you seem to kind of draw a distinction between, you know, a his, historian and a public historian, or, I, you know, we could maybe say more broadly a teacher. Um, do you feel that, cause I certainly have this feeling, you know, what I do in the classroom is a different mode from what I do in podcasts and putting out videos on YouTube. Um, do you, do you see that distinction or is it, is it all one to you? Well, for me, the, the two got, the two got merged, um, where like I am now a professional historian only in the sense that I, um, I produce these podcasts and I, I mean, I now have a book that's going to be coming out, but I am, I'm at least aware of it because I did wind up going back to grad school. Um, mm -hmm. I had to drop out of grad school. I keep, I keep like, I kept like <laughs> trying to get back into it and then just like life would pull me in a different direction. Um, that I at least have always drawn a distinction between like a professional historian, right. Um, and then somebody like me, who you would want to put some kind of qualifier on it. I'm a history writer. I'm a history podcaster. I'm a, I'm a popularizer of history. I'm a narrative, you know, a nonfiction narrative writer who works in history. There's all these like qualifiers <laughs> that you want to put on it because what, what a historian does is take something that we know nothing about and go dig around in the archives and do interviews and look at, you know, really like sketchy primary source material that nobody's handled before or maybe hasn't looked at in a new light in a long time and produce studies and new information that then somebody like me can come along and gather up all these secondary sources um, to tell like the world mm -hmm. about what is going on in history. Like here's, here's what we know about history. Here are the things that we've discovered. Here's the, here's the story as we know it um, so far, but you know, at, at no point in the history of Rome or revolutions um, have I ever needed to dig around in an archive and go explore and discover like new things. That's what a historian does. So I've, I've always been very careful to not call myself a historian um, as opposed to a popularizer of history is, I guess, the best way that I could possibly put it. Do you ever think of yourself as a teacher? Oh, as a as a teacher, yeah, yeah. I would I would consider I would consider myself to be a teacher of history, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, because that's sort of what I I hmm. think of. Not not exactly the same. You're not giving tests. <laughs> yet you can start right I, can't, I, I, can't, I, can't, I keep i keep I, that's that's like a rhetorical thing i use like don't worry about this guy he's not going to be on the test yeah. <laughs> um, but I've, i never i never I, there there are no tests or anything but yeah i i would consider myself to be like yeah as somebody who is producing content mm -hmm. that will teach that will teach people about about whatever um area i happen to be covering and i my hope is that in my expectation when it comes to like who who is listening to the show is um is people who know nothing, who want to know something, and then will walk out knowing something, right? That's yeah. that's like my intended audience. Although although you were would have been like the I, I have I have two like audience members in mind, or two listeners mm -hmm. in mind. There's when I write, there's the people who know nothing, and I have to explain it to them. Like that's the principal audience. But then I also keep in mind like somebody who knows something about the subject. Mm -hmm. um, who is going to be listening to it to like see if I'm doing it right? <laughs> and, and 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 all I really and all I really have ever wanted from those people is for them to listen to like you know and go uh go oh, yeah yeah that's yeah okay that was that was all right that was pretty good <laughs> yeah, yeah you just, you see you said the right people and you got the dates right and um you know you hit you hit the you hit the correct things you know um, so I always try to keep those people in mind too. Well, from the number of people I know who are. Uh, in the field in one way or another, or grad students or who went into um, studies because of the history of Rome, I think you're doing okay on that one. I, I can't <laughs> well, speak for lovely. revolutions, of course, <laughs> because I am completely uh, clueless on all of the revolutions you've covered so far. But for Rome, at least as far as I know, I think you did just fine. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I apologize as always for the pronunciation, but uh, you know oh, well. that's not my job. I don't be your guys. You guys can. Yeah. You guys can be like you can use me as an. You see it? You, you, you hear how Mike did? You see how <laughs> wrong that is? Like he actually managed to go in the wrong direction on every single. Story. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not my. Uh, that's not a particular pet peeve of mine. I'm pretty good at mispronouncing even stuff that I technically know very well how to say. Um, in fact, I one of my real problems is getting halfway through a word and realizing I don't know whether I'm saying it in English, Greek, or Latin and <laughs> getting, getting all three of them mixed up in the wrong way. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I've, I, I, yeah. And I've been right now, I've been, um, to be, because of, because of how much work I've done in French history now, oh, yeah. I've actually been, I've actually been studying, um, French. Oh, right. And so I've been, I've been learning French and, uh, then I, for the book, like I had to do the audio book, uh, which is, you know, there's tons of Latin pronunciation yeah. in there. And yeah, like the, um, the divergence of the way that French <laughs> treats every like C's and G's yeah. and everything and the way that the way that Latin does. So I'm like, I would constantly get confused whether I was trying to pronounce this yeah, in French or in Latin, which are like 180 degrees opposite. Oh, I know that's because so we're in Canada and, um, you know, the large and we're in particular in Sudbury, which is northern Ontario, and it's a very French area. There's a lot. It's a very Franco-Ontarian area. So most of my students uh, know French either as a first or twinned language or very well. And so as soon as we teach, whenever I'm teaching Latin, we have to spend quite a long time not saying a instead of et <laughs> and learning right. we have yeah, to pronounce exactly. we have to pronounce all the e's <laughs> <laughs> instead of leaving out half of them <laughs> like, yeah you, you've got to you got to keep going to the end of the yeah. word you can't, oh, just, every kind of, you can't just bail. <laughs> you can't you can't just bail halfway through yeah. and move on yeah because it's uh as you say and the, you know so many of the words look in the qui and quad are and and qua are really hard because qui looks like key and yeah there's a whole set of very specific French speaker problems with Latin. <laughs> that's, that's that's really interesting. That's really yeah. interesting. <laughs> I'm sure it be it must be completely, you know, a similar set for people who teach in uh, areas where everybody knows Spanish, and mm -hmm. um, there must be a similar kind of overlap problem. But but I, I know the French. Yeah, there, well, there's a, well, there's uh, there's some people that are uh, have been going through this class with me that were either native Spanish mm -hmm. speakers or had already learned it, and they they have they have a real problem with this. Um, Oh, uh, what do they call it? Espan, Espan oh, Francais. Okay. Um, I think it's, I think it's what they call it. Or is it? Fr oh, no, it's uh, Francais Espanol, where they just they'll they'll get into it and just start mangling pronunciation <laughs> and emphasis. Yeah, because yeah. because in that case, it all like literally looks and is supposed to yeah. almost sound the same. <laughs> For sure. So one feeling that I have, and I'm I'm curious to know if 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 this is your experience as well, um, is that. I think academics in the humanities um, are not doing a great job of speaking to the public. And so there, there is this area for successful podcasts and video channels to, to kind of move into that area since this, you know, in the sciences, there's so much about popularizers of science and they're doing re really well. A lot of scientists are, you know, kind of getting out there, figures, becoming public yeah. figures. Uh, but the humanities academics don't seem to be terribly interested in doing that. Do you kind of agree? Do, do you sort of feel that there's a lack of that out there? I certainly do. Yeah. No, I'm not technically going to complain about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it, it's given you a, an it's, opportunity. It's given, yeah. It's given me a, a wide open um, opportunity to act as a, as a go-between I guess between the public and and the humanities departments, especially like the history departments, mm -hmm. um, that I will I will go read their monographs and their articles, their journal articles, and um, and I will explain them to you. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there is there's definitely you know a a lack of it, and I I don't, and and again like if I I think had gone through I I've only touched on you know experiences in grad school. You know I've mm -hmm. I've been a grad student. I've been inside. You know the class. I've been a I've been a TA for a professor and all that, um, and there there is like there's a I don't know if it's it's not quite snobbery, but whenever there is somebody who like there there's one department in particular that I I won't like mention mm -hmm. any name here, but um you know there there's a there's a department there is full of historians and one of them uh happens to be quite good at writing popular histories and is kind of a prominent public um public intellectual 
and everybody else in the department hates him i guess because mm-hmm. he's he's not he's out he's like not doing his real job as a real historian yeah. um he's out there just kind of like writing you know popular books to be on tv um which they don't consider to be the real work of a real historian so you know it, i don't want to paint them all with a broad brush because i've had plenty of um you know academics and phds and doctors be like you're doing a great job and you know I, this work is like really important um but I think that there's plenty who just kind of, they don't, they honestly could care less about what mm. the plebs think. <laughs> it's one of the things that I've really, this has struck me when in balancing. So we've been, you know, Mark started by making videos, then we moved into doing a podcast sort of based around that. And we've been doing it, you know, I teach at a university, I'm a full-time prof and um, trying to sort of figure out where on my resume, and this, it sounds really pragmatic but this is part of the issue i think where to put video the work i help mark with in videos or the work we do on the podcast where that goes and you know it can go broadly under outreach but that's just a really kind of wimpy and meaningless term what does it mean when you're doing outreach public intellectual activity um and i think that that's actually and i've been looking around for sort of models of other people who are doing it and when i look at say history podcasts of which there are a lot now. There's a history of everywhere, which is great. I don't know that I have yet found one that's by a working academic. Someone who, you know, some of them are grad students, have been grad students. In terms of the narrative histories or the sort of um, doing a a broad scope of a historical topic, Mm -hmm. I can't think of one that's by a working academic. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting. I don't know how much of it is what you're talking about of attitude, and I think probably some of it is. I think some of it is just time. It's a lot of work, (laughs) as you know. Yeah, this is a a full-time job, what I do right now, right, for sure. Yeah, and, you know, people who are working academics generally often have full-time jobs. (laughs) Or even if they are not, uh, you know, tenure-track employed, they may even have a more than full-time job, even if they're getting less than full-time pay. So in terms of time, I think that's part of it. But I also wonder, you know, what that gap is. I think it's great that there's lots of people who are what one might call amateurs, though I don't want to make that sound like it's in any way dismissive. It isn't. But people who are not professionals in their field who are doing these things, I think that's great. But it's interesting that there's sort of this um, dichotomy between people who are professional in their discipline and then people who are doing the work by which most people at this point or many people at this point are probably getting their information about those disciplines. Yeah. I, I read there was, um, I forget what her name is now and that makes me feel bad. Um, but on, on Twitter, there was just a woman who she's a sociologist, um, who was mm-hmm. actually talking about this a bit. Uh, and she was saying that, like you say on with like just the straight, like brass tacks of the resume, um, you know, yeah. if you're, if you're trying to do a PhD, if you're trying to get into a PhD program or then complete your PhD, and then once you have your PhD, you're trying to get onto tenure track or you're trying to get into university, like there's no none of none of your public intellectual activities, none of those, none of that public outreach stuff, no podcast is ever going to count for what yeah. you're trying to do with your career. So it's just like you prioritize what it is that you need to do to fulfill your own, Mm -hmm. you know, hopes and ambitions and dreams about what you want to be able to do with your life. So it's not, you know, it's not necessarily, Oh, I'm just a snob, even though I just portrayed some of them as that way. Um, but I think there is some of that for sure, but it's not the only aspect. (laughs) But there is also just a really like, you know, there, there are priorities that need to be made. And if you're going to devote your time to anything, you need to be devoting your time to the thing that's going to keep you, that's going to keep you moving forward. Mm -hmm. But that snobbery, of course, is part of the problem. The reason these things don't count on your resume and they don't count toward the job is because they're not considered real intellectual work or real scholarship. And that's an an ongoing problem. And I do know a bunch of academics who have podcasts. I I should hasten to add, I I do actually know of quite a lot of academic based podcasts, but they tend to be very inside baseball kind of podcasts, but not actually inside baseball. But they're, you know, about um, interviews with people. How do you get into your PhD topic or how did you um, interviews with researchers or uh, discussions about philosophical ideas? Now, they may be open 
to the general public. And they some, sometimes are definitely framed as being about general public, but they're very much focused on, here's the research I do. I'm disseminating my research to the world. Now that's great. I'm not saying that that, but so it's, it seems like there's some movement saying, okay, podcasts that are very specifically about the new research you're doing, that counts as at least a certain kind of scholarship that people are starting. Some of the younger scholars are starting to get sort of rewarded for but if it's in any way just a synthesis of material or doesn't sort of represent new new information, then no, that still doesn't count. That's not scholarship. And I think that's the where the, the fault line lies now. Um, there's some mm. recognition that getting public, getting your own scholarship out there is a valuable move. But doing more of the sort of broad picture or the synthesis or what I think of as sort of teaching, mm -hmm. but moving out of the classroom um, doesn't seem to to register yet. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, I think that this is something that's been the case, uh, you know, I think this is a tension or whatever that has been around since the dawn of time, yeah. <laughs> uh, at least when it comes to universities where there's all, there's, I think there's just always going to be a space uh, for somebody like me mm -hmm. who is incredibly passionate about subjects, be is able to become highly literate in a topic mm -hmm. um, and then present it. And then with, with an eye always, on then being able to turn it around and disseminate the information because I, I think it's just an unqualified um, public good for, especially with history, yeah. um, for the citizens of a country to be literate in history, to have long perspectives, to know that, you know, here's how we got here and oh, by the way, like there's still a long ways to go and we actually have no idea where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, Rather than living, you know, what, what history gives you is it breaks you out of this like three month. I, I like I feel like most people live in like a six month bubble, where if it was more than three months ago, it's ancient history, and if it's more than three months in the future, it's like the what are you even talking it doesn't about? Exist. That's like so far away. It doesn't even exist. Um, and I think that history just gives you like a, a broader perspective that is just good. Um, and so people like me, I think, are always gonna are always going to have a place, even if we do then get called like amateur historians, which is fine. I, I'm learning to live. Yeah, with that's, <laughs> I, that's why I hesitated on the word, because I don't want to, no, it's, to say it in some way no, like that. But yeah, because, you know, reviews, reviews of the book have started to come mm -hmm. out and, you know, they, they will, you know, quite like sort of accurately be like, oh, th this is, you know, amateur historian Mike Duncan has done a lovely job with this book. It's great. I'm like, yeah, I do it for a living. Yeah, but you're right. You know, I am. I am not like I'm not a chaired PhD at, at Cambridge or anything like that. Um, so in that sense, I'm amateur, but I do do it for a living. You know, I, I do it for a I living. I would, I would, in in my uh, outside perspective on you, I would say you started as an amateur historian. That was where you came yeah. to the history of Rome as an amateur. That is someone who loved it and wanted to get into it. I wouldn't personally call you an amateur historian now. What I would say is that you are not a working academic. But that's very different than saying whether you're a professional historian or not. You know, that's to me, that's, that's a division. But of course, I'm inside a, a system that makes divisions on the most tiny and petty of <laughs> grounds. So, of course, I, of right. course, I'm well, good so, at dividing thing, things like, up. And, <laughs> yeah. And I and I don't I don't want to I don't want to like um, step on anybody's toes. Oh, yeah. I, I like uh, having a good relationship with um, with the academic community. Um, <laughs> So I'm always, that's fine. I'm, I'm an amateur. I'm well, no, as I said, I don't think you are anymore, but, um, but, and I mean, we were all amateurs when we came to it. I was an amateur classicist when I was an undergrad because that's, well, I certainly wasn't being paid for it. That's for sure. <laughs> for darn sure. And I came to it because I loved it. And I mean, that's the best reason for anyone to come to a subject. Um, you know, yeah. that's, a, this is me using, this is me being all etymological about it. And I can't help using amateur to mean a lover of rather than meaning, not good at, which is, I think, what too many people use amateur to mean, um, you know, yeah. driven by a love of it rather than driven immediately by a desire to make a living at it. That comes later. That's a lovely distinction. Yeah. And I will, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think of being, when you're called an amateur historian, just think of it as being saying that you are doing it for the love. Right. And then hopefully for the income too. <laughs> right. That's where the, the transition has come. Definitely nice. yeah, I, do have, I do have kids. Yeah. I have kids and a mortgage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On that point about history and the, the sort of literate citizen, 
one of the common threads that I I think I you know I, I think about a lot when I think about Rome, but I have been noticing also in particular in your most recent um, set of revolutions discussions, the 1848 revolutions, um, is there's a sort of common thread of how people use history. That is sure now when we can talk about that in a moment, maybe. But when we look back on history, we can look at the Romans using history. Um, their own history, the history of other peoples, uh, in for all sorts of purposes. And I, I think of this because of the uh, revolutions you're looking at right now, and you're talking about how the sort of the histories that were coming out about the first French Revolution are impacting how the court of course of revolutions are going on throughout Europe, uh, in, you know, a generation later. So, do you have do you sort of see that as a, a thread that goes through? Um, the work you've been, the, the periods you look at, or how do people use history? I would definitely say that that is a that of this that is a common theme. <clears throat> it's um, it becomes it's becoming more apparent in the 19th century because you really have the beginning of what I would consider to be modern histories. Mm-hmm. Um, not not until like the 18th century. Right? Yeah, I mean, like yeah. Gibbon, Gibbon, Gibbon is among you know the 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 beginners of it. You know, Hume wrote a great um, you know like history of England um, that was very very popular and influential. So you started you started having those sort of more professional like we're just gonna we're gonna study history and um, and then teach you about it and then have. But those works were all very much of their time, right? Like Gibbon was making a point mm-hmm. about the Roman Empire, but he was also making a point about Enlightenment philosophy. Yeah. Um, Hume, Hume was doing the same thing. Um, so there, there is now starting to be a plethora of historical books available, all of which I think at this point are being, I, I still don't think in 1848, you have any kind of sense of the historian as somebody who is trying to completely remove themselves from the present and only present as truthful an account of a particular period or event or person as they can based on the available mm. historical sources. Um, which I, I don't think that that even, I, I, I haven't, I've been so, I've been so, you know, progressing slowly through the years that I'm not even sure when I would say in the grand scope of, uh, you know, uh, Western historiography, uh, when that mentality uh, came into play, because all of these guys were writing histories and using the characters and events to put forward some sort of idea that they wanted for their contemporary audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that is a tradition that, of course, goes like all the way back to the Romans yeah. and the Greeks. Um, you know, those guys, Pl- Plutarch and Sallust, uh, they were all using history and the Romans, the Romans were incredibly literate in their own history, at least yeah. the literate Romans, at least among the political elite. They were all obsessed with their <laughs> yeah. own history and yeah. loved their own history. But um, they they were reading those history books and writing those history books to teach yeah. moral lessons. Um, they, it was just, how do, how do we, you know, let's have this guy give a speech. What speech is he giving? Do you have any idea what speech he gave? No, of course not. I'm mm-hmm. writing a speech. You, you know, Pericles' funeral oration is... Not Pericles, mm-hmm. it's Thucydides who's talking. Um, so that in that's a part of a grand scope of history, uh, mm-hmm. historiography of using history to try to influence contemporary events and comment comment on contemporary events and try to teach people not just about the past, but to teach people philosophy and ethics and all that, and also to make political claim. You know, I think of the Romans; they used history so much to make contemporary political claims, especially in the Republic, but certainly in the, in the uh, empire too, uh, you know, their own family histories. What, what role do they have uh, in, does do the family have in the Republican history of Rome and that affects whether or not they're going to be a good consul now and all of that. And then Augustus using his semi-fictitious views of history to reestablish the new Republic on uh, historical grounds, this continual repurposing of history uh, all the way through. Yeah. And, we, and I think a lot of that um, still exists mm-hmm. today. And I think, I, th- I think this, this is one of the things, and, and I am, I'm among those who thinks that, you know, like the storm before the storm is not like some vehicle for my own personal philosophy or anything like that. Um, it is, 
but it is an attempt to use the past to shed some kind of historical light on contemporary yeah. events. Like here's there, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff that's going on right now in the world. Um, if you look back at history, is there any is there anything from history that can help shed light on what's going on now, or give us some clue about how things turn out if we do it one way or do it another way? Um, and I think I think that going back and finding historical events that you know have some analogous setting or impact um, is a perfectly good thing mm -hmm. to do. Uh, I think if we try if I think if we go too overboard on trying to remove history from present mm -hmm. times, right? Number one, it's yeah. impossible <laughs> um, because everybody's all, every, as much as you try to get away from it, you're always, you're always writing in your own mm -hmm. period and according to your own, your own generations, trends and ideas about what's important. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I, th I think you can go too far with it and try to separate history from current events. And if you go too far in that direction, now we're just, now again, we're just aimless and we don't really have any moorings and we don't have any light to help, you know, guide us forward. So that's my thinking. And that makes, makes me think in a sort of roundabout way, um, about the middle ages, because, uh, you know, my background is as a medievalist and I started listening to the history of Rome to sort of shore up my rather spotty knowledge of Roman history. <laughs> um, but in a time when, uh, kind of medieval history is being used and often misused, uh, I wonder if you'd ever thought about uh, tackling a medieval period or a medieval topic by way of uh, kind of correcting some of those um, misunderstandings of, you know, and misuses of, of the medieval. Right. So, so I'm, I'm famously like, I, I, of course, uh, what did I do? I, I finished the history of Rome. Uh, I got to 476 AD, AD. I said, okay, I'm leaving. And then when do I come back? Oh, like round about the Renaissance mm -hmm. is when I pick it back up again. Uh, which yeah, is there's like, a fine like tradition I'm, of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely like just playing into that, um, into that mentality. But those are just the two, it's just for me, those are the, the two periods that I've always been really interested in is like early modern history. And um, I mean, even that, like calling it early modern is, you know, has its prejudicial um, mm -hmm. connotation, right? When it comes, you say like, oh, it was the dark ages and was it really the dark ages? Well, I don't know. They didn't have running water anymore, but <laughs> so, who knows? Um, but does that, does that even matter? Um, so I, I have always personally, um, like for me, I, I would be kind of the opposite where I always had a really good working understanding of Roman history. And then you get into the medieval stuff and I, it becomes very spotty for me. Um, so I would be, I think, interested in listening to that podcast. Um, and, and maybe, maybe I would want to, do it but um you know it's it's it would be entirely entirely new material for me right. and like at this point in my career i'm not sure that I, I would want to go dive that deeply in a in a thousand year period that um i'm really not super comfortable with like you know there was charlemagne and you know then thomas aquinas <laughs> and uh hmm, let's see what happens next machiavelli like oh look i was a political theory major <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's how that's how that's, no, that's though, a like, spotty no, period like, for political no, theory i, know, I yeah, gotta say uh, <laughs> yeah well hey man there's marcellus of padua and uh you know some of the john of you know yeah those guys well okay so what you're saying is that you're not going to be doing the peasants revolt anytime soon <laughs> right, I pro I probably will not be doing a medieval <laughs> history podcast. That would be that would be well outside. I don't I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm in revolutions yeah. like forever. There's now. quite a few um, of them. <laughs> yeah, and you know it was it, 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 it exactly the same thing happened to me with revolutions that happened with the history of Rome, where it was you know it was very it was a very manageable thing that I had taken on, and it was going to take three three and a half years for me to get <laughs> through. I was supposed to be done with revolutions by this point, and I'm like still trying to get 1848 properly off the ground. <laughs> um, so I've got like four more to do. So I don't know what my next podcast is going to be at all, or if I what what happens next. I don't know. I can't even bother to think about it. Yeah, and um, given. I'm, I'm speaking for you here, but given that 10 years ago, you probably couldn't envision exactly where you are now. It maybe doesn't make sense to worry too much about what you're going to be at 10 years from now. Who knows what yeah, new field or medium <laughs> or uh, technology or whatever there might be out there too. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I've got, well, I, I, I really, um, it, you know, nobody actually probably read this, but famous, at least in my own mind, is um, when, when I moved from, when I got married, uh, which was in the middle of the history mm -hmm. of Rome, and we moved from Portland to Austin, um, I was like, okay, I'm going to take like six weeks off. And then I, I wrote a little thing about how like, like here, here's the plan is I'm going to finish the history of Rome. It'll take me, you know, a couple more years. And then I really don't know what's going to happen next because I mean, like technology moves so fast, like podcasting probably won't even be a <laughs> thing in three years. Like we'll have all moved beyond it. Um, which is like the exact opposite happened. It became <laughs> like, it's uh, it suddenly like had its moment. And then now I'm looking back on it. I'm like, why did I ever think that like on-demand audio content would not have like an endless yeah. shelf life, which it probably will. Yeah. Um, which shows, well, which, which is like itself, like you can know uh, all the you can want to know about history, but like your ability to predict the future is limited, very, shall we say? <laughs> very, very limited. As we were all sitting around being like, well, this Jeb Bush Hillary Clinton presidential campaign sure is going to be a sewer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Like, is, are we? Are you? I mean, like in 2015, we're we're writing like, is this going to be literally the most boring presidential election <laughs> in modern history? And everybody agreed that it probably oh. would. Be. <laughs> oh, halcyon days! <laughs> yeah, we know, we know, not we know, we know nothing. No, no, and there is a. I mean, there's a danger in talking about things as being unprecedented because it rarely is completely unprecedented. But it does feel like there's a number of things that. Um, we aren't unmoored from history that we can still look back to it, I think, but some stuff is a little harder to find parallels for right now. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's been a, there's been a few continuity yeah. breaks, but yeah, as, a, as, a, but yes, as a historian and as somebody who has, um, you know, has sort of made these mistakes like early on in mm -hmm. my career where I would say like, this is the first time such and such ever happened. Or like, this was, um, you know, nothing like this had ever happened before. And you would, you would get an email like 48 hours later that was like, Oh, well, what about this and this and this? It's like, right. Never, ever, ever say this is the first time that anything <laughs> happened. Uh, because like, you just don't do it. It's yeah. just, you don't never write that sentence. Um, because there's all, there's always something, there is always, always, always something that, um, you can point to and say, well, actually this did happen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that point of sort of modern parallels and modern use, um, I noticed that on Twitter in particular, there's an awful lot of people who turn to you as the expert on Rome and now on revolutions anytime something comes up. Um, and there's this impulse to keep finding the parallels, right? Who's the Julius Caesar of our time? Who's the, um, do you, do you like that game? I, I, you seem to engage in it sometimes and people certainly are always asking you like, is Trump Caesar or is Trump Antony or is Trump, I don't know, God knows what people think he is. Um, is that a fun game to play? It, you know, not really. Yeah, <laughs> that's what. That, for to, me, I find be, it a little bit problematic. So I wondered. Yeah, to be to be perfectly frank, like no, not really, because um, you know, basically, the more specific you get, the less it the less it works yeah um so you can you can say like broadly oh there are there I, and i think that this is actually true is that broadly speaking there are comparisons to be made between uh late republican rome and um the early 21st century united states and then kind of more broadly um just the, the west like western europe canada like mm -hmm. um united states like we're all kind of dealing with issues that are that are quite similar you get into like, oh, well, you know, is Trump crassus? Like, no, he's not crassus. Like, that's not how it works. It's yeah. not, you don't, you don't literally cut and paste individuals. Like when, once you start to get into, when, if you start trying to make it too granular, it doesn't work. Um, and then especially like, you know, like Trump, Crassus was actually rich. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He wasn't like, a bankrupt. He was actually, he was, he was actually rich. Yeah. He was actually like a really good, he was a really good ruthless businessman. Yeah. Um, he was actually a fairly talented politician mm -hmm. who was able to accomplish uh, quite a bit in his life. Um, so no, Trump's not Crassus. Um, mm. And so ge generally speaking, you know, like, yeah, what, like is Trump this emperor or that emperor? Like mo most of that stuff I let go mm -hmm. because it's not really worth uh, it's not really worth getting into because none of it, none of it really works in the end. Except Julius, C except Julius Caesar and Napoleon. Right. right? Then, then you, well, when people are consciously like, okay, modeling themselves lot, on someone, yeah, <laughs> different yeah, issue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's like, I will grant that Napoleon and Julius Caesar are like very similar figures. Yeah. <laughs> but that's like saying that Julius Caesar and Alexander have their parallels. That's because Julius Caesar spent a part of his career trying to be the new Alexander. So <laughs> maybe, there, right. maybe there's some connection there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I find, uh, I mean, it can be entertaining, but it does it does kind of set me on edge a little bit. I think it's that impulse of typology um, that you see. The Romans were very fond of that, of course, of saying, you know, Augustus is the new Romulus or whatever. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a biblical exegesis process. It's like, who's the new Old Testament prophet in the New Testament? That's fine for a text. I don't think it works in real life. <laughs> Yeah, that's not that's not actually how the history of humanity is unfolding itself. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, sharing some time with us. And I want to just reiterate, okay, it's so the storm before the storm. <laughs> and I think this episode will probably be out after it has already become available. So everyone, okay. go get the book. It's available. And you're going to be um because i think it'll come out in the beginning of november will you still be on your tour then you'll be on the book tour i will be but if it comes out in early november i by the time you are listening to this i will have come and gone from the east coast right um where i did some stuff in uh, in new york and boston and philadelphia and washington dc i will be at the wisconsin book festival on november 4th um i will have a thing in chicago on november 16th uh, there's going to be a Milwaukee date in there that I can't remember off the top of my head. But really, if you're looking for the future and you happen to be on the West Coast, mm -hmm. um, the first week of December 2017, I'll be in uh, L.A., then San Francisco, then Portland, and then Seattle. You're looking forward to it? I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to the tours in general. Yeah, that's uh, what I But, yeah. you know, that West Coast swing. You know, I'm, I'm, fr you know, I'm from Seattle originally, and... Um, well, the history of Rome started in Portland. Right, uh, right. right. It was, you know, started when I was uh, like, I, I'm, I have an event at Powell's uh, in Portland, which is like, I mean, that's like the the homecoming of all homecomings <laughs> because most most of my uh, original Roman history library was like bought in that store, right? right. <laughs> uh, ten or 12, ten or twelve years ago. So it's it's really cool to now get to come back and like have a book on their yeah. shelves. Like, yeah. it's crazy. And it, of course, gives you an opportunity. I guess when you used to do the history of uh, Rome tours and the revolutions tours, you got a chance to meet actual people who listen to the podcast, which is, I think, something that a lot of podcasters never really do. <laughs> uh, but you'll get to meet a whole bunch of them now. <laughs> I, w I will get to meet a whole bunch of them. And, you know, the thing, I, maybe we can end on this, but like one of the things that has, that I'm almost like most mm -hmm. proud of about all the shows that I've put out, like what, what you know, what's the thing that's proud of? Like this, the, like the secret first answer is that the people who listen to the show, when I meet them, they're like uniformly like intelligent, funny, nice, kind people. Mm -hmm. um, so like whatever, 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 whatever sort of the show is, like whatever the kind of person it happens to attract, um, are are that way. They're like uniformly lovely, nice, funny people. Um, so like whatever it is that I'm doing, <laughs> You're doing it's, something it's, right. it's, attract, it's attracting, it's, yeah, it's, I like, I don't know what it is, but, um, I'm, I've never not been just utterly delighted, uh, to meet listeners of the show. Well, that's great. And I'm un unfortunately being up in the wilds of Northern Ontario, we're not going to be able to manage to get down to any of, uh, any of your dates, but I look forward to the, um, Twitter reports on, on the events. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, my, yeah, my Twitter feed is about to turn into a nonstop publicity fest. <laughs> <laughs> every, every, everything up until now has been merely in the service of having uh, tricked, you know, a couple 10,000, 15,000 people into following me on Twitter. Um, so that when the book comes out, they can, they will just be subjected to endless publicity. Very, a long game, but a good game. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. You gotta. You gotta. You gotta play. You gotta play. You gotta play a long time. Man. <laughs> well, have a fabulous time, and I very much look forward to the book and it being out. And I may have to read it and listen to the audiobook because I'm not sure that I can quite handle just reading your words and yeah. not hearing you. Gotta hear it. Hear, hear your voice. <laughs> it's, it's. 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 I've. I've gotten that plenty. I. You know. I did. I did record yeah. the audiobook, so it will be me. You do have the perfect sure. podcast voice, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much and have a great time on the tour. Thank you. 
For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.